Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be with you this morning, Wednesday morning, and uh, well, morning on this side of the world, afternoon on the East Coast. Um, this today's Ask Sharon is kind of, so I tell you, every week I come up with something that kind of hits me. So yesterday morning I was teaching a class at, with my dear friend Elaine Rawls at Grand Canyon University on marketing. And she reminded me of a, a time um, right after I left Rich Dad when I was uh, going full bore, right, 24-7, building this company and expanding them. And then I made the decision to leave and it's like, oh, what's next? What's next? Have you ever felt like that? And so I remember I had, when I talk about power of association, I brought my friends and some of my mentors and people who really knew me because I'd had a bunch of different people coming up to me and wanting me to get involved in their companies. And so I literally had my, you know, the big table in my dining room where we launched Rich Dad. And I had down the center of the table, I think probably close to 10 different companies that had come to me and wanted me to get involved and they realized that I had left Rich Dad. And, so, and they were all, every one of them had a level of interest for me and some intrigue. And I had people come, um, my friends, and really talk about each one of them. I wanted to get their ideas as their thoughts on what they thought I should do. And during that process, and what they were, you know, what they were sharing. Each one of those companies was wonderful. One was um, a, a toy company for early development for infants to keep their, you know, to get a child's mind creative and growing. I thought that was very intriguing. Um, but there were about ten different companies, and um, I remember a dear friend of mine, Mike, um, said, "Well." There's only one. Are you expecting another rich dad, poor dad success? And it was like they're all a little sarcastic, but you know, so it was pretty funny because he doesn't know me very well. And certainly that was an enigma. We never expected rich dad to be the success that it was. But um, it, it, it actually triggered in my mind well, I'm not as passionate about anything on this table as I was about financial literacy and financial education. And everyone around the table um, pretty much saw the same level of interest that I had, but it made me realize that I was trying to get busy. Um, I, I think I was fearful of being calm for a bit and thinking about what I wanted to do in my life. And so I was kind of pushing myself into saying, well, I've got all these great opportunities, but none of them were the right opportunity. And um, you know, there are times when we say yes to investing in a company, but this was one where I was gonna actually get on board and build it. And I realized that even though um, they were all great opportunities, they were all good companies, they were, none of them was the right one. And so it was a kind of the dawning of that day, spending people, people that knew me the best was to realize that sometimes no is the correct answer. Even if you know you can support somebody and you can do something with them, um, maybe it's not the right application of your skills, your time. Your, it's not your personal success equation. And in fact, I think Seth Godin um, talks about really making sure you say no to certain clients. And that's something that we're getting a little better about here. You know, we've got people that want to ready to write checks or want us to do mentoring, but they're not at the right spot. Many times somebody will come here and sit down and meet with Mike and I, and they want us, you know, to help them do things. And at the end of the hour, we go, you're not ready for us. You know, we don't want to just take people's money. And so one of the things that uh, I felt was important when you're playing big is also to make sure you're playing with the right people, both from a standpoint of power of association, people on your team, but also that you are taking the right clients. And sometimes it's okay to say no. And sometimes it's better to say no than to say yes. And being someone that always wants to say yes, um, it's something that I've had to learn over the time. And I still, I actually still struggle with it. But it's something that uh, in the long run, is this relationship part of your overall plan to get to where you wanna be? 
to play big, that bigger picture. And sometimes no, sometimes you, you need to say no. Um, and before I go further, let me get into some of the questions because we have some good questions today. From Marie in Kansas, I have an interior design business that I've been running for over seven years. And for the first several years we were in business, we had steady growth and I was able to build my team as demand increased. The last two years have been much more difficult to keep the momentum going. Our revenue has been steady, but costs have gone up. And without finding ways to add revenue, the net effect is that we are less profitable. I'm in the process of exploring new vendors and find, finding ways to better manage costs. I believe this is important, but would rather spend my energy on growth. Most of our business is high-end residential. We have bid on a few specialty commercial projects, but have not had any traction securing those opportunities. I'm up against vendors who can operate at larger scale and can play more with their numbers than I have the flexibility to do. Should I not worry about breaking in a different category of customer and focus instead on expanding my customer base in high-end residential? Well, Marie, that's a great question, and I bet quite a few people that are watching today have had that when you, you know, you've got to establish one area. Um, and as an aside, when I talk, teach people about real estate, go focus on one type of real estate. Maybe it's the three, two residential market and get really good at that. Get the system to know how you find the properties, how you get the tenants and how you put it into play, put it in the system before you try to focus on commercial real estate. So you may very well have the same situation. If you have found success in high-end residential, then you know are, what are, are you doing enough to market within those networks? Because they're the greatest testimonial possible. When we're doing work, you know, I just call my friends and find out who they use because that's the greatest testimonial there is. And so if your profits have plateaued, gone down because your costs are going up, then um, it's a good thing that you're looking at how to reduce your costs, but let's talk about focusing on that top line revenue and maybe trying to expand it into a new arena is, it's always good as you continue to scale your business, but let's, if that's, if you're finding additional competition there, um, you know, take a, take a little time to build this side of your business by getting those testimonials and get those people that can, tell their friends because that's you know the quickest way to new business is through um, the referral of very happy customers and it sounds like you have a few so focus there get that revenue flowing again and then focus on how you're going to build the systems to do the the commercial properties as well because it sounds like you may have a few satisfied customers there too but it is you know that it that isn't a market where um, Commercial property owners are going to want to know that you've done successful work with other commercial property owners. And that's something you have code requirements, you have, um, you know, all kinds of different restrictions that you have to be, make sure that you're very well versed in and you know. So I have oh, well, lots of people with me this morning, Michelle and Cesar and love it. Thank you so much. So happy. And, and Eric, Tracy, Gloria. Oh, hi, Gloria. Wonderful to see you join us. So it's been just a, a, a great week. Um, I'm getting myself ready to head to Orlando. And you'll see in my, in my feeds, I'm, um, I, I was able to, they, they, I have some VIP executive level tickets for the event in Orlando on February 26. So please email us at info at Sharon Lecter if you can come to Orlando. We're going to have a great day. I'm again sharing the stage with Susie Orman and with um, uh, Jillian Michaels. Hello, I know that name. All right, next question. Um, Jeremy, I'm in my final year of business school and have been actively participate, participating in the recruitment process with potential employers at my college. After several interviews with companies that I would love to work for, my experience is that I've been passed up for candidates we have more practical experience in my field of study. Although I have worked throughout college, it was in paying positions so that I could support myself rather than working at internships with little or no compensation opportunity that but would have been more relevant to my future career path. I believe that I have value to bring, but I'm just not packaging it well in the interview process. How do I highlight my real life experience to compete against people who have what is considered more relevant experience? Well, Jeremy, um, 
I, I feel I feel your frustration. I certainly understand it because you you needed to make the money to support yourself. But this is why it's so important to try and get that kind of experience. And um, I, just keep keep plugging. There's somebody out there that's going to give you that opportunity. Um, you know, maybe volunteer while you're still working to make some money. Maybe find somebody that's going to help you let you come in and do a very short internship, at least to get on the resume. But it's important because this is a real, this is a real problem. It's something that's uh, very, very um, big in today's world because a lot of people don't do internships anymore because the tax rules around them have changed. So having that uh, relevant experience is important, but you might also want to look at it, you know, and use my mantra, why not? Do something a little different. Maybe you, if, if it's in your field of study, write a little ebook about what it is you do. I'm not sure you said exactly what you do. Um, uh, you, you didn't tell me exactly what your um, position is, but you know, there might be something that you've learned in college that's appropriate, how your industry has changed. So write a little short ebook about it so that you can add that to your resume because that may very well balance out the lack of experience. And, um, you know, and, and maybe in doing that, if there's three or four employers out there that you targeted that you'd like to work for, call them and ask them for a comment um, so to add to your ebook. So again, you get the, your face and your name out in front of them. And that's something that uh, every one of you has that opportunity to do. So keep keep at it. Don't don't give up. Keep working. Next question, Penelope from Santa Monica. My question is not so much about business, but more of parenting. All right. Well, see if I can help you out on that one. Um, I know you're a mom and you have passion for empowering kids. My child is in middle school. Is relatively popular and good at athletics. He isn't necessarily gifted academically. But with hard work, he has the ability to do well. Well, hard work, there's a lot to be said for hard work. He expressed interest in a specific program at a nearby high school that is specifically, um, especially rigorous. And after hearing people talk about how much work it takes, has decided it isn't for him. I'm a little disappointed that he's consciously decided that he just doesn't want to work as hard as is required to be in this program because I do think he's capable. There will be other opportunities available to him, and I want him to have enough confidence to risk failure and at least give it a try. Do you have any advice for a mom that sees more potential in her child than he seems to see in himself? Well, Penelope, I'm probably going to get a lot of um, pushback on this, but um, if, the, if you in your heart believe this is something that is a sweet spot for him and something where he can excel, if he just puts a little energy and effort into it. You know, when I do, when I talk about allowance, I talk about, you know, they're not paying a kid for allowance for brushing their teeth, making their bed, because that's personal responsibility. And then there's family responsibility. Um, so doing the dishes is, is part of being a community. And then there's community responsibility. So taking out the neighbor's trash if they're out of town or something, the things like that. But then there's that, level of responsibility which is independent thought and that is doing chores around the house extra chores um cleaning out the closet or cleaning out the garage where i you know i believe allowance is in, is in play the other thing is when you have a child who is um not able to get a part-time job because they are involved in a lot of afternoon sports or they are in um, rigorous academic tracks then there is an element of if you know they are applying themselves and working towards it there's an allowance that goes along with that and so this is a case where that triggered in my thought if this is something that this that you he really wants and you believe it's the right path for him and that you're afraid he's going to not seize an opportunity because he doesn't want to work that hard maybe there needs to be an incentive that is commiserate with his application of himself. And that's where, um, you know, some people call it bribery. I call it recognition of him going above and beyond what a child his age would normally do and therefore rewarding him for it. And that's um, that, that level of responsibility is a recognition 
of the fact that he's going above and beyond what a, a normal teenager his age would do. So that, and then also um, find a way to let him stick his toe in the water in that field so that maybe he gets even more excited about it and maybe he comes to that realization of his own that that's what he wants to do. Because at a teenager, you know, it's, it's not about future career. It's all about, you know, cars, friends, music, you know, the here and now. And so it's hard to get a teenager to get transfer from the here and now to what's good for them in the future. And it's just human nature. You know, our, our grandson is going to a different middle school than a lot of his friends. And, you know, we're going through that process now where he's very frustrated. He's leaving an environment in sixth grade where he's the king of the mountain, top you know, student council president. And now he's going to be going into a middle school environment. And I'm a little worried because he's going to go in where he doesn't know a lot of kids. And so that, you know, not only is he not going to be with his friends, but he's going to have to reestablish, you know, his, his leadership. And he's up to the task, I have no doubt. But that transition is going to be difficult for him. It's for his, difficult for his parents. But I'm very confident that he can do that because he's such an incredible kid. But it doesn't make the process any less painful. And um, I know as soon as he's there and he makes two or three friends, he's going to be fine. But that's not till the fall. So between now and then, there's a lot of drama. But with your son, I would say, you know, if you can find a way to get him, you know, maybe even go audit that program at that high school. Um, call the school and get the opportunity for him to go um, really experience it for a day or two. And that he can see the excitement and the other kids, that meet some of the kids that are in the program now. And that's something that can really get them excited. So think about that and see what else you can do. All right. Um, Bob in Salt Lake City. I know a Bob, Bob Snyder, but this isn't him, I think. Um, I have a business that provides networking and technical support to small businesses. Our business has grown a lot in the last 18 months, so much that for the last time, for the first time ever, I declined a new client and it didn't feel good. But I just don't have the bandwidth in my business to take on another project and still do a great job for the clients I have. I've expanded my team and it can expand it more, but I'm not sure I have all the right systems in place to get too much bigger than I am right now. Do I accept the new opportunities and say I will figure it out or stand by my ground on not taking anyone new, um, new on until I've got a better foundation from which to grow? Well, Bob, that decision, I, mean, I can't make that decision for you, but um, one of the things that um, can maybe soften the blow is if there's a client that you don't believe is in your sweet spot, um, through your network and your associations, maybe you know somebody that you can refer them to. So you're not just saying no, you're just saying, I want to find the right solution for you, even if there's no economic incentive to you. But sometimes you can actually have a relationship with this individual who maybe is, there, is a better, um, better home for that client, that you get a referral fee. But at the end of the day, you want to do what's best for your potential client. And, um, and so instead of saying not, no, say, um, I'm not sure we're the right fit, but I have somebody who can help you, and I think you'll feel better about it. And part of it is that you're making the decision that's right for the customer, for yourself, when I decided to do the play big movement, I reduced the time I committed for mentoring and reduced the number of mentoring clients I had, but I was able to do it with the time at the end of the cycle for a lot of my mentoring clients that were able to, you know, continue moving forward. And so it worked out well, but again, you do it with thought as to what the best rev, what, what the best result is for you and for your client. Um, you know, if you're, Focus on solving the problem or serving the need more than the money. Um, the, there are times when you want to say yes and figure out how, but if you aren't, don't have the foundation of your business. And so I recommend check out our program called Essentials of a Successful Essential Components of a Successful Business. And Angela, if you can put that link in the comments, I'd appreciate it because you need to have the systems there in order to grow. Because what happens if you say yes too many times and you end up overloaded with people, then you're not gonna serve anybody well. 
And that's the worst scenario. So it is possible that your answer is exactly what you've already proposed, where you need to take the time to build the business so that you can start saying yes to as many people as possible. Um, this is one of the things, you know, Angela and I have been working for the last few weeks. We're looking at a new partner to help us grow the website and online presence and actually do some online marketing, which we've never done before. And we have two fantastic companies. It's been it's very, very different. Well, we had a lot of fantastic companies, but we've narrowed down to two. And in, in the final consideration, it was like, we, which one um, allows us the opportunity to, um, well, they're both, they're both great companies. One is more focused on um, the incredible results they have in Facebook marketing. But we had to take a step back and I said, you know, I'm not sure I'm ready for that yet. I'm ready to test it, but not jump in the deep end. Um, and, and I'm saying that I haven't, you know, that decision, I, we still haven't had those final conversations, but I want to say yes, 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 because the opportunity is fantastic, but are we ready for it? Because we have to put together the customer journey and redefine the customer journey. And so it's been an interesting process that we've been going through. And um, I don't like to say no to anybody. It's still something I have a hard time with, but sometimes it's the best for you and for them. And, and when you kind of elongate it, it's, not, it's frustrating for everybody involved. So let me, I think I have one more question um, from Veronica here in Arizona. I love this topic because I especially have a very hard time saying no. I bet there's a few people watching and listening to this that that applies to you too. Huh? I'm gonna you know, raise your hand if you have a hard time saying no. I want to and I'm willing to help whoever I can. But the problem is that I only have so much capacity. This is true both in business and my personal life. So I overcommit myself and they get super stressed out about trying to figure out how to meet all the commitments I have made. I really need to learn how to be okay saying no to people. You must have people reaching out to you all the time and don't have the bandwidth to talk to everyone personally. How do you tell people no without feeling guilty and being comfortable that it was the right decision? Well, Veronica, my answer is Angela <laughs> and my team. Um, you know, Mike and I both have an issue with saying no. And so as a, as a business, we've had to put together systems here at the office so that neither one of us answers the phone, um, typically. Because if we do, we can't not talk to somebody. And yet we have clients who pay to talk to us and pay to have our advice. And so it's not fair to them if we just talk to anybody freely. Um, and it's something that neither one of us likes saying no. So we put systems in a place so when somebody comes in and they want to talk to us, there's a screening process. And that's to benefit them as well as us. Um, you know, maybe they're not ready for us. Maybe they're not uh, in the right space, in the right industry. You know, we do a lot of work with, with authors and publishers. And sometimes we have people call us and they want to write a book that's a you know a fiction book that has nothing to do with my area of expertise. So it's better to let, you know, refer them to someone who can help them. But again, it's that screening process and creating those systems, that interview process, um, the you know, onboarding process to see and make sure that they are a fit. And then um, if they are a fit and they want to, you know, they understand what, how our system works and what opportunities are real. We're very flexible about custom tailoring um, plans and mentoring programs. So you don't have to fit into our square hole or uh, round hole. You can, we will custom design something for you depending on what your needs are. But that goes through the system. You know, and Angela typically is the one that will understand what it is you're looking for and your needs and create the system that works best for you. But it's also why we created the Play Big Movement course because not everyone can afford the level of mentoring that we offer, but everyone has the opportunity to play big. And so we sat down and said, all right, so people, some people, a lot of people call to us and they're still very, very financially stressed. And so that's why we created the two separate courses. 
you know, the, the math money mastery course is helps people that are still financially stressed get to being break even. And then the play big course is once you um, break even, we used to show you the steps to play big. And by playing big, I mean financially free. And this, so this is not a 30 day and you're, you're there course. Um, this is a, the process that you go through, the action steps that you take, as well as the mental mindset action steps that you take. And this is the process that I've been through um, with every one of my companies. And it's what I had to do after I lost my son and kind of went into a neutral zone where I was just numb. I had to get myself back into that process. And that's why I wanted to share it. But when I, I love my high level mentoring clients, cause that gives me that ability to work one-on-one. -on -one. I realize a lot of people want to know the information. So that's why we created the course. So it's very inexpensive, but you get the same information and you get video. You just don't have the same, you know, I don't, I'm not stepping into your business, but some of what a lot of people now have done have taken the course and then they have that knowledge and they have that so that they can call and do a shorter mentoring program and at least um, get some input from me on how to apply it. That's also why we have the Play Big Movement private Facebook group. So if you've not joined that, please do. Um, it's free it's, and it's not limited to people in the course, but it gives me on Thursday mornings, I do a, a Facebook live in that private Facebook group. And it gives an opportunity for people to have that dialogue and interact with each other as well as with my, me. So um, a place to give, make, ask those questions and get the answers that they need. But when it comes to saying no, um, focusing on what you're good at, and sometimes you have to focus and say, you know what, we're, we're going down a rabbit hole here. Have any of you felt sometimes you go down a rabbit hole? What is your core focus? What is your definite purpose? And um, you know, saying no. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, right here in Phoenix, somebody was, is host, was hosting a gala, you know, and they're doing it at their home, and they wanted me to keynote it. Um, they wanted me, well, you know, just to be there to kind of be a, a co-host. And it was one, you know, it sounded like a lovely night. We talked about it, but I don't, I don't know these people. They came to me because they wanted to have my support and be able to use my name. And it was for the arts. Well, I love the arts, but it's not my industry. It's not what I'm passionate about. And um, had I, you know, I was going to have to move some other things around and, um, not go to a seminar where I was able to speak about financial literacy. So it was like that decision of, I have to say no, and I don't like to say no. And this, and what, it was a real compliment to me that they reached out to me, but you know, you, we get back to what I shared a few weeks ago. How are you spending your time? Are you spending your time or are you investing your time? And a lot of times I find myself, I'm spending my time doing things that, uh, that aren't really driving me where I want to go. And I, you know, think about the book Outwitting the Devil when it talks about drifting, right? Whatever, you just kind of go with the flow. If somebody asks you to do something, say, okay, yeah, why not? Well, why not? You can answer that question if what they're asking you to do is not going to help you get to where you want to go. Now, if the choice is, is social, purely fun, great. But define it for what it is. Um, power of association, sometimes you go into an arena that you don't have any connections with to just meet more people. Well, then define that as what your intention is. What is your intention with how you are investing your time? And then um, when you say no, you know, it's painful thinking about it. It's painful saying it, but more than likely, once that gets passed, you're going to feel proud of yourself for making a decision that's appropriate for what you want to create in life. Hi, Dina. Wonderful to have you with us. And that's, uh, you. please, I see all these hearts. Thank you so much. I love it. Um, but share your own thoughts because that's exactly what we talk about. And in this world of instant communication, um, in fact, I, this is an, I'll share this with you. 
I am, um, as you may or may not know, I've been chairing, I chaired the last two years, the Women on Boards by 2020 event here in Phoenix. They came to me asking me to launch it for Arizona, and I made a two-year commitment. So actually tomorrow I pass the baton to the new chairman for this year, and they're going to be taking it over it. But um, I had an organization reach out to me yesterday, NABO, which is a huge you know, national organization, but the Arizona chapter wants me to come participate on a panel because I'm an expert in that right now. And um, the panel they want me to talk on is – the legislate they're doing a pro and con conversation about the legislation in California. And I really want to be there because I, you know, NABO is a great organization for me. And yet um, it's not congruent with my own thought process. While I believe we need to have more women on corporate boards, I don't believe in the mandate and they want me to come represent the pro position on mandating women on boards. And I am a 100% free enterprise, free market, free choice individual. I'm not, you know, I'm not crazy about regulations. And so I'm going to have to say no. In fact, I may, and what, what I'm thinking about now is should I say no, I'm not going to do the pro, but I will do the con. Um, and we'll see what happens. I don't know. I haven't made that decision yet. So you know about it before I've made my decision. But I, you know, the first step is I say I can't, I have to say no to being in the pro position because it's not congruent with my personal beliefs. And, um, you know, there's nothing, you have to be authentic because it comes through if you're not. So if that's something, there are a lot of women out there that are very vigorously supportive of um, mandating that. And I think um, I might be able to help them find somebody to do the pro position very quickly. But um, in fact, I think one of the new chairmen coming in is perfect choice. So I'm going to be talking to them about it. And you know it before they do. And um, we'll see how it turns out. I'll keep you posted as to what the reality is. But I challenge you to think about where you need to say no in your life. You know, I've talked about closing one door for other doors of opportunity. Well, sometimes that means saying no. And, uh, you know, and there's so many times with Mike and I, we get these opportunities. In fact, yesterday I got an invitation to be someone's guest at a gala. Um, and it's like, it's a real honor to be invited to do that. I mean, it's a several thousand dollar event to be a guest for them. But it's an organization that we haven't been involved in. And, and it means cutting short something else that we had committed to do. So I you kind know, of have to sit back and say, wow, well, I'm we're highly complimented, but I think it's probably going to be a no because it's not, you know, it means not focusing on the things that we've already committed to focus on. And so have you been in that position? And is there something in your life that you need to say no to? Um, and every day, if you want to play big, it means say no to areas and things that don't help you play big so that you can focus on investing your time to getting to where you deserve to be. So thank you all. I love you. Have a fantastic day and know that you are playing big. Number one in your field, living your legacy and creating maximum impact.